Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, on behalf of myself, Alice, and Mark, we want to greet you in the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we continue the study that we have been doing for a number of weeks now on second, Paul's second letter to Timothy. Uh, as a matter of fact, this, I believe this is the eighth, eighth week, eighth program. And uh, I want to remind you of two things before we get going. It's always a good idea to be able to take notes. If something strikes your fancy, you have a question. You can always contact us at office at BibleTalk.com. And there was something else I wanted to remind you of, but I can't remember what I wanted to remind you of, so pray for me. Let the Holy Spirit will remind you. Yeah. All of the studies are available all the time on Bible Talk. Once, once they're there, we always leave them up. They're available. Just go, go look at them. If something blesses you and you want to share it, tell others to go to BibleTalk.com and watch them. Right? Proclaim that, the word. Proclaim the word. That's what we're called to do. And as a matter of fact, that's what we ended the last session on talking about proclaiming the word, discipleship. So we're going to start right now after Alice prays and asks God bless, God's blessing on our time here. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we just praise you, we bless you, and we thank you for all that you do for us. I mean, especially thank you for the time that we have to study your word, Lord, and that we ask that you would fill us with knowledge and understanding and that we would be strengthened by it that we can proclaim it to all that we need. Amen. Amen. Yeah, that, that is, uh, we're, right now we're starting in the uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to read verses 3 and 4. But what we had talked about was Paul instructing Timothy to pass on what he had learned, or what was learning from them to others who would teach it to others. That's discipleship. So that's part of what we want to do. What, what we learn, what God gives us, we want to pass along to others, all right? But let me read verses 3 and 4 now. Paul writes, Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Suffer hardship. Well, that's, a, that's something you, would, you don't hear people normally proclaiming. <laughs> well, that's, that's going to be my point, you know. As I said, we've been looking in the, in the preceding verses, and last week as we closed, about Paul's instruction to Timothy to entrust what he was teaching him to other faithful men who would then teach it to others. Discipleship, right? Viral, contagious Christianity. Yes. And that's exactly what it's supposed to be. That's what true evangelism is. It's just uh, you catch it. Catch it. <laughs> So with this current verse in, what we have to ask is this. Suffer, suffer hardship. Avoid being entangled in everyday life. Living the austere, disciplined life of a soldier. The goal, the only goal is to please the Lord. Is that really the message that the church is passing along? I don't, I don't believe so. Well, that's a reasonable question because that's what Paul has written to Timothy, this should be the message that we're preaching, okay? Paul and Timothy both, uh, uh, virtually with every other man, woman, and child in the Roman Empire, would have, at the time Paul is writing this letter, they would have been very, very familiar with Roman soldiers. Yes. I mean, Israel yes. was an occupied right. land. Absolutely. I mean, they would, they, would, they would constantly see the Roman soldiers. Mm -hmm. They were everywhere. And they were intentionally very, very visible, especially in occupied lands like Israel, right? Because Rome wanted them to see the presence of Rome all the time. And by the way, a little PS here, Paul would have been especially familiar with Roman soldiers, having been imprisoned in Caesarea Philippi and now writing this letter from prison in Rome. I mean, he knew what he was talking about, and he had, he had a close personal contact with a lot of Roman soldiers, okay? Yes, yes. So when he says to us that we're to be good soldiers of Christ Jesus, you know, I, I just have to, I have to take a moment, just a moment. Okay. <laughs> uh, as, as many of you know, Alice and I and Mark were down in Belize uh, for a couple of years as missionaries, Belize, Central America. A long time ago. 
Yeah, a long time ago. <laughs> time flies when you're having fun. And I was hit by a speeding semi-truck down there. And I wound up in the hospital. I use that term loosely yes. <laughs> back then, all right? And um, be because of, well, I, I'm not going to do the whole thing, but pretty much everything was broken. All my ribs on my right side were broken. My pelvis was broken in a number of places. My knee was destroyed. My hip was broken. You were, you were pretty smashed up. I was pretty smashed up. And in the process of getting me out of and into, back into my bed, such as it was in the ward that I was in, they punctured my lung. And, I mean, I, they can both attest to this. You know, I just, I went gray and I couldn't, I was struggling, struggling to even get a breath. And as I sat there and Alice was praying, I think he may have been crying a little bit too. Oh, yeah. yeah. I heard a sound in the hallway coming in. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that it was a local pastor, Belizean pastor, his name was Lizard. It's a local pastor with two women from his small congregation. And as he came in and they, they, he was playing a guitar and they were singing. Mm -hmm. And the song they were singing was, I hear the sound of the army of the Lord. Well, I got to tell you, that made my spirit jump. Yes. Because it just so happened that the very last sermon that I preached in the church that I had pastored in Florida before we went down there was about the army of the Lord. I mean, it was just a connection. And he and I absolutely connected. connected. Oh, yes. And as we shared scripture back and forth, God healed my punctured lung. I mean, that was... That it, was it was amazing because you weren't conversing pleasantries. No, we were conversing scripture. It was the word. I mean, each each of you just spoke to each other in the word, with the word, and you just continued to be healed. Yeah, but it was about the army of the Lord, so yeah, that, that kind yeah. of touched me when, when Paul's talking about, you know, being a soldier. A soldier, disciplined, devoted, and part of a larger whole, stands fast on guard against all schemes and attacks of the enemy, right? but does not entangle himself in the affairs of everyday life. You know, it says in Ecclesiastes 4.12 that if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him, and a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Now, the reason I mention that is because when I was younger, I had, I had boats, and I spent a lot of time around the water on boats. And this is, again, back in the old days. Uh, not a lot of nylon line or anything was... So one of the things you always did, you would splice in order to get it, it splice line together. Does that make any sense? Do you understand what I'm talking about? Splicing mm -hmm. line. Take two lines or take an end of a line and kind of weave it into the That's tree. exactly the right term. You weave them together. Mm -hmm. Because once that's happened, once they're woven together, they're they're tight. They're like they're tight. Mm -hmm. They're not gonna break. Well that's what that's what the Greek here has in mind. When Paul says you know, you don't be entangled. He's talking, you can't be weaved in together with the world. Locked in, all right? Now, we're in the world. We're not supposed to be of it. God knows that we have to go and travel around in this world. We're not supposed to be so connected that we can't just, we're not supposed to be a part of it. We're supposed to be in it, but not of it, right? So we have to be really, really prayerful as we go along in life about our connection to the world. Because as I say, we're supposed to be there, but we're supposed to be there as, as a light. We're the light of the world. That's we're supposed to be there as a salt of the earth. We're, we're there as ambassadors for Christ. Mm -hmm. And an ambassador is not part of that country, whatever country he's in. Yeah. He is there representing something other. We are in this world representing the kingdom of God. All right? So yes, you're in the world, but don't, don't get entangled in it. For what fellowship has light with darkness? What, what fellowship has Christ with Belial, right? There's a, there's a warning about, the, <clears throat> about this too, right? Paul wrote, the, or Peter wrote, 2 Peter 2.20, says, For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world by knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. So if you come to know Jesus Christ and then go back and become entangled in, you're, you'll be worse off than you were before, okay? If our life is spliced together with the Lord, it's going to be spliced together with, either with the Lord or with the world. 
No man can serve two masters. You you have to make that One choice. And if you're spliced in with both, both it'll rip you, you apart. You can't. I mean, you, you it'll it'll rip you apart. Yeah, but you can't take a splice. I mean, you don't want. No man can serve two masters. Right? Mm -hmm. We have to choose who we are going to be connected to. Right. Um, if you if if our life is spliced together with the Lord, well, whichever it is, it's not going to be broken apart easily. No, that's no, the point, that's right? Something. And the purpose of this, Paul says, is so that we, he, that one, or we, may please the one who enlisted him. Mm -hmm. Right? That's the goal, to please God, to be approved by God. Jesus at his baptism, right, in the, jo at the Jordan River, when he approaches John the Baptist, what happens? He says, and after being baptized, Jesus went up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove, and coming upon him, and behold, a voice out of the heavens saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Matthew 3, 16 and 17. That's our, that, that's our great desire. It should be our great desire. You know, I, I did these seminars for years, traveling around. And I we talk about, you know, I... They started out, we call them success seminars, which I changed because there were too many different definitions of success. Very quickly, yeah. But I said, well, there's only, to me, the only definition of success for a Christian is that when you come face to face with the Lord God Almighty, that he says to you, well done, thou good and faithful servant, mm -hmm. that you have pleased him. If you haven't done that, you've been a failure, no matter what you accomplished. On, and by the way, a lot of people are going to come to him, and the first thing they're going to tell about Jesus about is what they've accomplished. Lord, Lord, look what I did in your name. Mm. Right? Go read Matthew 7. You know, say, depart from me, you evil ones. I never knew you. Be focused on what he has done for you, not what you've done for him. And again, on the Mount of Transfiguration. You know the Mount of Transfiguration? Jesus goes up the mountain with Peter and John. And on the mountain it says, And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll make three tabernacles here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. They were the three that they met up there, right? Mm -hmm. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Matthew 17, 4 and 5. That's what you want. That should be the goal of our life, is to hear the Lord say to you, I was well pleased. See now, because Paul writes to Timothy just a few verses on from where we are now, in, in chapter 2, in verse 15, and says, be diligent or study to present yourself approved unto God. That's our, We want to be approved unto God. And Paul wrote to the Galatians saying, for am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Galatians 1.10. You can't please the men. and I mean, you can't strive. That can't be your goal, to please men. Because then you will not please God. You know, I've quoted this a couple of times, just momentarily, but... Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, no one can serve two masters, yes. for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. Matthew 6, 24. So th think about this. You've got to strive. You, or, you know, it's not so much a strive because it's not difficult. It's a choice. Yes. You have okay? to, the indecision is what's a killer. Indecision is always a killer. But the point is, you have to... Have you ever sung the song, I have decided to follow Jesus? If you sang that song, did it come from your heart or from a songbook? So in verse 5, I'm going to move along to verse 5, it says, And also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. You want to win the prize. Paul wanted to win the prize. Listen, he's preaching what he's living. He's living what he's preaching. You know, in Philippians, I love Philippians. And in chapter 3, Paul writes, Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid a hold of it yet. But one thing I do, 
forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul was looking for the prize. And he was willing to pay any price to gain it. But you have to play according to the rules. Now, I think many of you, if not most of you, may not be able to remember this as well as I do. Do you remember the 1972 Olympics? Come on, you're only a kid. Okay, Mark is our youth group, by the way. Okay. In 1972, and this is just before, or not long before, but before I was saved. And I was very, very much into sports and athletics. And so in the 1972 uh, Olympics, I basically plunked my set, myself in front of a television set and watched the whole thing. 19, well, let me start by saying this. You know what a marathon is, yes. right? A marathon is a distance race. It's 26 miles and 365 yards, I think, is what it is. Yeah, 26 miles. And the Olympics were being held in Munich, Germany. And as most Olympic marathons, what they do, I mean, the, the trail they followed in this race wound all through Munich in the area, right? But it, at the end, it came back into the Olympic Stadium. So they come off the road and they run through a tunnel and they run onto the track. And that last 365 yards is run on the track. There was an American. Now, Americans didn't win marathons an awful lot. I mean, most of it went to Kenya. But this year, Frank Short, or Shorter, was the American running the, and he, he was in the lead. I mean, this man had, he had it pegged. So they're coming by, and they're running in, and they, they run into this long tunnel going into the stadium. And out comes this German guy, waving his hands. And from you know, dressed from, from the German team, and he's running, and Frank Shorter follows him by, I don't know, 50 feet or so, and Shorter is in shock. He's just looking, and and the crowd is first of all, I mean, the crowd is cheering the other guy. There was only one little problem. The, this guy that came in from, he had just started the race in the tunnel. He was hiding there. He was hiding in the tunnel. Yeah, I mean, this was infamous. You, 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 you I remember ever hear that? Okay, yeah. he was hiding in the tunnel. And when he saw Shorter approaching, this guy ran out, waving his arms, and he's dressed you know, with a German athletic. Well, the security, once, I mean, it was like the crowd, everybody was mass confusion yeah, really until the security <laughs> ran out and grabbed this guy and carted him off. You see, you got to play by the rules. That's right. You can't run a marathon because run the last 365 yards, right? Yeah. Everything has to be by the rules. And, and by the way, I just, this is a point of fact. That was the 1972 Olympics that turned into a horror story there in oh, Munich right. when Palestinian terror terrorists attacked the Israeli team and murdered, I don't know how many guys, how many, uh, about a dozen Israeli contestants. That was, uh, so I think maybe shorter and that whole incident got lost in that. Uh, but Play, you got to play by the rules. You, you can't make them up as you go along. You can't cheat. But a lot, a lot of people always try and cheat. All right? When you don't follow the rules, but you're still a Christian, now that, let me put quotes around that with a small c. If you call yourself a Christian, but you're not playing by, what, what rules? I'll show you what rules. I got the book, rule book right here with me. That's the rules. If you don't play by the rules, okay, you're playing by the traditions of men. Or you're playing by your own rules. Mm -hmm. And you will get caught, and you will get carried off. Just like that guy did, okay? Mm -hmm. Think of what Jesus said in Mark. Mark 7, verses 6 and 9. He said to them, talking to the, the religious leaders, he said, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the traditions of precepts of men. Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. 
He was also saying to them, you nicely set aside the commandments of God in order to keep your tradition. You better play by the rules. Well, when you think you're out there and everybody's cheering for you, you're going to be carted off and go to some place you don't want to go. All right. In verse 6, zooming right along, it says, The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. You know, Paul had written to it in his first letter to Timothy, and he said, For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle the ox while he's threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Okay? You work, you're entitled to what you work for, what you've agreed to. Now, if that's not the case, you know, how, how do you distribute? Well, what, what's the right system here? Is it communist? Is it socialist? Is it, I mean, you know what? Is it communist? The early church, they held all things in, in common, and there was no need. That's one, it was wonderful. So were they communists? Or when they took care of one another? Out of a common body, were they socialists? That's basically what socialism was. Were they cap communists? Were they socialists? Were they capitalists? No, they were Christian. Okay? We don't fit into the world system. We don't fit into the world's labels. We are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, operating in love. It's not any one of those things. It's all of those things in the right time, in the right place, and in the right way. Right? So then he goes on in verse 7, and he says, Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. You know, Peter had said one time that some of the things that Paul said were difficult to understand. Yes. Paul's a very deep guy. Mm -hmm. right? But the simple fact of the matter is, you have the ability to understand, because God will give you the understanding. Right? Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. But you've got to consider what the word consider means. What? Ponder. It, mean, it means to ponder, yes. It means to think carefully, to pay attention to, to examine. In other words, it's not just a casual glance, yeah. right? It's to give serious consideration. So that's what Paul's saying. Really, Spend time, think about what I'm saying, consider what I'm saying, examine what I'm saying. And if you consider and ponder and think on this, God will give you give understanding. Give you understanding. Who is wise? Let him give heed to these things and consider the loving kindness of the Lord. Psalm 107, 43. You've got to consider the loving kindness of the Lord. And then Jesus in the, in the Sermon on the Mount in Luke said, Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap. They have no storeroom or barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than the birds? And, and just a little bit on in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. But I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. That was Luke 12, 24, and 27. But have you considered it? You know, just read by it's, it's the verse, right? My, one of my, my favorites, and this had great impact in my life. I'm not going to go give my whole testimony, but this is the one. I encountered Jesus Christ when I didn't know Jesus Christ. I had been a, a quote-unquote Christian for a lot of years. But on one day, my birthday, I sat down, and I sat down, and Alice had brought a Bible into our house, something I had never had. And while she was out getting me, it was my birthday, getting me a birthday cake or whatever she was doing. I looked up, I was having a cup of coffee at my table, and I looked up and I saw the Bible she brought into the house and on top of the refrigerator. I went over and I picked it up, I brought it down, and I sat down, and I said, Jesus, if you're real, I want to know. And I just flipped open the Bible, flipped it open, and I looked down, and I saw this. When I consider thy heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, and it was like, pow. And I heard the voice of Jesus, and he said to me, not only am I real, but I know exactly what's in your heart. Because that had been an issue with me. The stars and the moon yes. and the stars. Really many happened. years. Many years. So I thought I considered it. But then, years later, I was preaching at a, at a church here in Orlando, Florida. And I was sharing my testimony during the middle of the sermon. And I said that. I said, you know, I went over 
And I, I had this experience. I opened the Bible and I said, because I looked up, you know, I would consider, and I looked in the moon and the stars and they humbled me. And I heard that still small voice that I know so well. I'm in the middle of preaching a sermon. I heard the voice of God say to me, that's not right. You're wrong. Well, that was a, that was a shock, I'll tell you what. So I said to the congregation, I said, excuse me one minute. And I turned around. And I said, what, Lord? I, I mean, what's wrong? What's, what's wrong? He said, it was not the moon and the stars that humbled you. You see, the moon and the stars, as it is written, proclaim my glory. It was my glory that humbled you. Amen. So even though I had thought I had considered it, and this is years after I got saved, I found out that I hadn't fully considered it. Still more to consider. There's still more there to get full understanding. Yes. God wants us to understand. He wants us to have. Until you consider the heavens, the moon, and the stars, you may never see the glory of God there. The Lord will give you understanding. There is a grand and great difference between seeing something, something is revealed, and understanding something. You see a lot of things you don't necessarily understand, right? And people, what they end up doing instead of getting understanding, they speculate. Oh yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's extremely common to see something and yet not understand it, okay? Hear, O sons, the instruction of a father and give attention that you may gain understanding. That's Proverbs 4.1. Hear, O sons, the instruction of a father and give attention that you may gain understanding. Give attention. It's back to consider. And that leads to understanding. We, we need to not just get into work. These Bible studies, I mean, that's why I said it's, it's more important that when you leave this Bible study, if you have a Bible study. Well, <laughs> you have a Bible study with the Lord. Consider, have conversations with the Lord. Okay? Consider what's been said. If something has struck you during the course of this Bible study, consider it, test it, examine it, scrutinize it, talk to the Lord about it. Yes. It is the Lord that gives understanding. Understanding doesn't come from a degree in a college. Okay, no matter how advanced the degree, understanding comes from the Lord. It is His to give. All right. Thank you, Jesus. All right. I gosh, I don't know. Yeah, I'm running. I'm not, I'm not very fast. Yeah. I may be keeping I'm not very fast. Okay. You're, we're going fast today. Yeah, zooming along. So, but I don't think we're going to get into this too much. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8 says, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship, even to imprisonment as a criminal. But the word of God is not imprisoned. Well, that's what we're going to talk about when we gather again, once again, next week. Because there's a lot of meat in all of this. And God wants to give us understanding. So, Father, we thank you, Lord God. We thank you that the things that you reveal, you manifest. And the things that you manifest, you give us understanding if we seek you. If we diligently seek you, Lord God. And it's our desire to understand your will. That we might do your will. We just praise you and thank you for the Holy Spirit that you have sent into us to lead us into all truth. We praise you. We bless your holy name, Father. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, till next week, be back. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days. I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love, my comfort, my shelter.